My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we get another straight-talking update on the radiation leak at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site, in Carlsbad, New Mexico, with watchdog Don Hancock, Director of Southwest Research and Information Center. He tells us everything we need to know about radiation and kitty litter. Then Ray Lutz of Citizens Oversight Project fills us in on the shenanigans surrounding the proposed, possibly done deal, over somebody's dead body, $3.3 billion San Onofre bailout of Southern California Edison. Pork at its most blatant. Learn the hard facts and the harder truths. All this plus numbnuts of the week coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, May 13, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. We're going to start with the WIP story because it continues to be the largest one happening, certainly in the United States at this time. Here's the way the last week rolled out. On Sunday, May 4th, it was announced that waste drums from the Los Alamos National Laboratory may have caused the radioactive leak that took place starting on Valentine's Day, February 14th. They said at that time that there was a possibility that a chemical reaction may have occurred rupturing the drums inside panel 7, which is where the radiation is coming from. Because other waste from Los Alamos may now present a hazard, all shipments from Los Alamos to the Waste Control Specialists, or WCS, site in Andrews, Texas, have been stopped. That does not, however, mean that things are safe there. Bradley Bugger, the Department of Energy's Carlsbad Field Office media contact and spokesmodel, said that between April 1st and May 1st, there were 39 shipments of WIP-designated waste containers from Los Alamos for temporary storage at the Waste Control Specialist Facility in Andrews, Texas. In those shipments were 459 separate containers. As many as 100 shipments, 10 per week, had been planned, but those plans have since been put on hold. Bugger says the waste already at WCS is being kept, quote-unquote, inside, with no further explanation of what that meant. He went on to say it is being closely monitored for, quote, evidence of heat and, quote, melting seals. But if there's a great enough concentration of nitrate salts in any of those containers, it could cause another mild explosion. Then the question becomes, will having the containers inside, whatever inside means, be enough of a barrier to prevent an additional release of plutonium and americium into the environment. No answer on that one. Bugger added that the Department of Energy is still working to determine the root cause of the plutonium americium release from the WIP site and cautioned against using the word explosion to describe, well, the explosion. So when is an explosion not an explosion? I guess when the DOE says so. Well, enough of this. Let's get the straight talk. Don Hancock is an environmental watchdog based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He has been following the WIP site since before it was a gleam in anybody's eye for decades, and he's been helping Nuclear Hot Seat listeners navigate through the information since the radiation leak began on February 14. Listen up to the straight talk. We've learned that a change in a binding agent that was used with the radioactive waste from Los Alamos may have been responsible for the leaks at the WIP site. What can you tell us about that? Well, I don't agree that we have determined that's the case. One person, Dr. James Conka, who used to work uh, for the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, who is a WIP booster, self-proclaimed. He thinks WIP is the location for all of the nation's nuclear waste of all types should go. Has posited that theory, which may or may not have any basis to it. It's not totally impossible, but neither Los Alamos nor the WIP folks have confirmed that. And the evidence so far that we've seen from the videos, including the most recent video from last Saturday, entrance in the underground necessarily support what he's saying. 
DOE itself has said that their term is there appears to have been an energetic chemical reaction. With their most recent photos, they talk about the thermal damage that's been caused. So for a lot of lay people, when you think of chemical reactions and heat, one uses the explosion word. DOE, for a lot of reasons, doesn't want to use the explosion word, but it appears that there was some sort of explosion or potentially multiple explosions. But what caused them, we don't know yet. Given that this kitty litter story has gone out, and it's quite compelling because it creates an image in people's minds, what further exploration is going on into the causes, or are there people or agencies that have signed off saying, fine, we've solved it, let's move on? Well, as recently as this morning, the 2B head of the Department of Energy's Environmental Management Program testifying before the Senate Energy Committee, who has to recommend her confirmation to the job, said that she didn't know what the cause was, and DOE didn't know what the cause was. She was directly asked by Senator Scott from South Carolina if she knew and when WIP was going to be reopened, and she said she didn't know, DOE didn't know, she has no idea when WIP is going to be reopened. So she's, within the next few days or weeks, will be the DOE person in charge of dealing with the WIP situation, which she acknowledged at her hearing today would be her number one priority. She was testifying under oath. So I know that she and the Department of Energy have not signed off on they know what happened. So we don't know what happened. It's going to be a continuing thing. We aren't going to know for a while and when and if the Department of Energy decides that it thinks it knows, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the world is going to agree with that. And so I would encourage people to not think that Dr. Conka's kitty litter or any other explanation is sufficient in and of itself to determine what's happened. Given that it looks like it was containers from Los Alamos that were involved... Well, we don't actually know that either. DOE at the town hall meeting last week said, and it's true, that they're looking at other sites. We've long known that high nitrates, which is one theory of what happened, are not just in the Los Alamos waste, but the site that has very high nitrates in addition to Los Alamos is the Idaho National Lab which also has recently shipped waste to WIP. So it may or may not be Los Alamos waste. So given the provenance of these two places being the potential source of whatever it was that happened with those containers, have they been tracked to WCS in Texas as well as WIP? Idaho is not sending any shipments to waste control specialists. Los Alamos is. Los Alamos has several hundred containers at waste control specialists. 116 of the Los Alamos containers at WCS are from the same waste stream as 55 of the 258 containers in room 7 of panel 7 at WIP. So yes, the further shipments from Los Alamos to waste control specialists of containers from this waste stream have been suspended. That doesn't mean that there's the conclusion's been reached that it's from that waste stream because there are other very similar waste streams. But, yes, DOE has clearly suspended the shipments. Um, we do know the data. We know the containers that are at WCS. And as I say, as I count them, 116 of them at WCS are the same waste stream. So it is a problem. If it is Los Alamos waste, and if it is from this waste stream, and if you've had one or more of those having an explosion in the underground at WIP, it would be a problem if there was an explosion in the storage building at Waste Control Specialists. And I have been told that WCS has taken some actions both to undo the stacking. When the, when the landal waste came to WCS, it was stacked. It's now been unstacked so that it is easier to look at each single container and do some testing on them to try to determine in advance 
if there is a thermal buildup, for example, that could be a precursor to a chemical reaction or could be a portion of a chemical reaction and a sign that something's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. So some measures are being taken with the waste that is at WCS. Whether that will be sufficient or not obviously remains to be seen. As I have been saying for more than 12 weeks, there's a lot more that we don't know than what we do know. That's still the case. What is known about the health impact on the 21 workers who were confirmed to be exposed to the radiation? And is that the current number, or have other workers been found to have been exposed? 21 is still the number, as far as we know. There's been a total information embargo for the last five weeks on the health status of those 21 workers. We've never had any independent information about the health status of the workers. We've only had the DOE explanation and the data that DOE was willing to put out until the end of March, which identified not by name but by number the 148 workers who had gone through some kind of testing to see about contamination. But we don't know. DOE's position has been that they got very small doses and it's not a problem. DOE's position has been that they don't need to see medical doctors that have experience in treating people with internal radiation contamination. Hmm. And DOE has not, in fact, although they, the site manager said he would, has not responded to my question on April the 9th of whether the health insurance policies that the workers have would pay for them going on their own to get a what would we would usually call a second opinion about their status and treatment, et cetera. So we unfortunately know very little about the worker status. I think that's inappropriate. I've said that in numerous situations, including to the WIP people. Uh, I continue to say that. I'm hopeful that the workers are getting independent medical treatment and evaluation, which I think is what should happen. I think their health insurance should be paying for it so they can get, just like anybody else that may have been exposed to something, wants to go to a doctor and maybe wants to go to a second doctor to see what folks say. How has the Steel Workers Union, the representative for the workers, been responding on behalf of those 21 contaminated workers? They haven't wanted to say, and by saying that, that's an accurate statement on my part, so I'm not making it as a value judgment. I am presuming and have some indirect reason to believe that the Steel Workers Union is trying to protect all of the workers, and not all of the 21 workers were members of the Steel Workers Union, but I believe the union is interested in protecting all of the workers, but exactly what they have been doing or not doing, I don't actually know, and the union has so far, to my knowledge, various people, including various press people, have tried to inquire of the union to get a response, and to my knowledge, the union has chosen not to respond publicly. Has anything new been released about actual radiation leak, the direction it went, how far, any kind of follow-up monitoring that was supposed to take place? DOE continues to, as they're required to do by the state of New Mexico, continues to regularly release at least once a week their data Air data, their soil sampling data show below detection limit. But, of course, these are the same people with the same instruments that didn't show the releases that did happen. So I'm glad that DOE is doing sampling and releasing the information, but I'm not satisfied that it is complete and accurate as we would want. Are they checking the exact same locations, or have they spread out those portable monitors they were supposed to be getting in? They've done both. They have continued to sample the same locations, and they have added 10 additional portable monitors, and they have been doing sampling at those sites. So they've been doing both. I'm glad that they're doing that. In my mind, that's not sufficient, both because of their poor track record and because they're not really independent, per se. (laughs) 
the two more independent groups who are continuing to collect air samples and who have collected soil samples are the State of New Mexico Environment Department and the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center. CMERC, the, the, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, um, continues to regularly post, as they have them on their website, their air monitoring data. They collected soil samples a long time ago. I've consistently asked them about when they're going to get the results back from the lab and publish them and have continually been told it's in process, it's in process, it's in process. They were most recently told me that they would uh, publish their initial soil sampling results last week. As of right now, when I'm on their website, they still have not been published, so I'm not sure what the problem is there. I mean, I know that they have sent their soil samples to their laboratory and et cetera, but so far those have not been released. The New Mexico Environment Department has collected soil samples. The last I heard from the Environment Department is they don't have sufficient funding to get all the lab samples tested at labs, and so they're holding on to the samples and we'll get them tested and we'll publish the results as they have money and as the results are available. So at this point, on air, we have CMERC and DOE data. On soil, we have only DOE data. Is there anything that we who wish to support transparency in this process and getting this act and the information straight, is there anything you can suggest that we could do to support you? I appreciate the thought, and I support the concept as as much as can be done. I think the problem is basically with the Department of Energy still being too slow and still wanting to keep the lid on information as much as possible, and that's inappropriate, and anything that you and anybody else can do to raise that issue to DOE directly, to members of Congress, to the press, would be helpful. One thing that is historically true, as you know very well, is one of the important functions that you and other people do by raising public attention is the more public attention there is to something that gets more of a response. I communicate several times a day with folks at DOE and folks at these other agencies, etc., but other people communicating is helpful. And to suggest to them on a regular basis that in addition to whatever statements that DOE wants to make, what people would most like to see is the data. I have had DOE people say literally to me, well, we don't put out the data because nobody other than maybe you, Don, is interested in it. And I say to them, A, that's not true, and B, it's not up to the Department of Energy to decide what the public is interested in or not and what the public can understand or not. As a government agency, their responsibility is to put out the information, but they still don't have that yet. They put some information out more than they used to, but they still don't put it out as much or as fast as they should, and so the focus needs to be on them. And when other agencies like CMERC do get their data out, people should express their appreciation for them doing that kind of work because they get a certain amount of pushback from the Department of Energy uh, as well. That was Don Hancock, Director of Southwest Research and Information Center, and more than a watchdog, a bulldog, when it comes to the WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. We will continue to be in contact with Don in the coming weeks to learn more about what's happening at the WIP site. As for the calls and email he requested to help get the Department of Energy to release the data they have on the Valentine's Day radiation release, here's the contact information. Contact the aforementioned Brad Bugger, who is with the Department of Energy at WIP. His email is bradley, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y, dot bugger, just as it sounds, B-U-G-G-E-R, at C-B-F like Frank O dot D-O-E dot gov. 
or you can call him at 575-234-7545. We will, of course, post this information on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. I love being able to say that again. Now back to the news. We're going to stick with the U.S. and focus in on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The NRC has drawn up a list of 21 reactor sites in central and eastern U.S. that must carry out in-depth analyses of updated earthquake risks as a matter of priority. Yeah, think? The NRC has been reviewing updated earthquake hazard information submitted by the 60 reactor sites in the central and eastern region as part of its implementation of lessons learned from the 2011 Fukushima accident in Japan. Hmm. Three years later, and they're just getting around to this now. Some priority, guys. The NRC has now set two priority lists for the completion of follow-up work to carry out detailed risk analyses based on the reevaluations. The first list of 10 sites, and by the way, the specific sites are not listed in this report, but the first list of 10 has been given until June of 2017, meaning three, count them, three years from now, to submit their detailed risk analyses, while the second list of 11 sites has a deadline of December 2019, five and a half years from now. Oh, yeah, big priority. Let's hope there are no earthquakes between now and then. All 21 sites on the priority list have also been given until the end of this year to complete an expedited approach review to ensure that the plant's systems and key components, particularly cooling systems, could ensure a safe shutdown if an earthquake were to occur at a higher seismic ground motion than allowed for in their original design. What? The NRC is still deciding whether a further 23 sites in the central and eastern regions, including TVA's unfinished Belafonte site, will also require a detailed risk evaluation. NRC spokesmodel from the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, Eric Leeds, said, If a plant's new hazard exceeds the original design, the plant has to do a detailed analysis to determine any changes in accident risk from the quake. Dude, if there's a problem with the earthquake being bigger than the design specifications, the last thing we need are a different set of analyses statistics. That's rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. Similar reevaluations are being completed for three nuclear power plants in the more geologically complex western U.S., Palo Verde in Arizona, Columbia Generating Station in Washington, and Diablo Canyon in California. So while the NRC is dicking around trying to figure out the exact extent of the risk that we may be facing, on March 6th, the NRC reported that Unit 3 reactor at the Browns Ferry nuclear plant in North Alabama automatically scrammed due to low reactor water level as a result of a trip of both recirculating pumps. David Lockbaum, the Chattanooga-based director of the Union of Concerned Scientists Nuclear Safety Project mused, Odd, the plant's safety studies explicitly state that this will not happen. Lockbaum, by the way, is a nuclear engineer who once worked at Browns Ferry and later at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as a nuclear safety instructor. Browns Ferry is the Tennessee Valley Authority's oldest nuclear plant, and on Tuesday morning, May 6th, the newest of three reactors at the plant, 100 air miles from Chattanooga, automatically shut down. It's a sign of trouble, especially because other safety features were supposed to ensure that the two pumps would never quit at the same time. Lockbaum told Free Press reporter and editor Dave Flessner, apparently, Browns Ferry operated outside the bounds of its safety study. I wonder how such a thing could happen. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's the NRC. And Monday, May 12, was not a good day in NRC because there were two separate reports that came in about nuclear reactors. One is from my old buddy, Three Mile Island near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Fuses used to protect the motor power conductors appear to be inadequate to protect the control conductors. 
What this engineering gobbledygook means is that under fire safety shutdown conditions, it is postulated, merely postulated, that a fire in one area can cause short circuits potentially resulting in secondary fires or cable fires in other areas where the cables are rooted. Mm, So much fun. Meanwhile, and this has got to be my favorite one of the week, just missed for numb nuts. At the Riverbend Nuclear Plant in Louisiana, station management determined that tritium was confirmed to be present in water samples taken from leakage underground in the turbine building. The leakage was tested for gamma and tritium activity, and no gamma contamination was detected. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Let me tell you. Tritium is a beta emitter, not a gamma emitter. So, of course, you're not going to find beta radiation coming from a gamma emitter. And yet, there it is, in black and white from the NRC. Oh, those wild and wacky guys who are running our nuclear protect people and the environment program. Over to Japan, where a manga comic strip is kicking up more attention to Fukushima than all the op-ed editorials that either are or are not running. In the April 28th issue of Shogaku Kan Weekly, the long-running and popular Oi Shinbo manga series featured a group of characters, all newspaper journalists, who visit Fukushima Daiichi and are momentarily exposed to hourly radiation levels of 1,680 microsieverts. After their tour, lead character Shiro Yamaoka begins to complain of extreme exhaustion, as well as sudden nosebleeds that span days. His colleagues confess to suffering similar symptoms. Later, when they meet a character named Katsutaka Idogawa, which is the same name as and is based on the real-life former mayor of the town of Futuba in Fukushima Prefecture, they learn that he, too, has suffered repeated nosebleed attacks and felt unbearably sick since the accident. Itagawa tells them, Many Fukushima residents have been afflicted by the same symptoms. They just don't say it openly. When contacted by the Japan Times, Shogaku Kan Weekly's managing editor said, The episode drew on meticulous reportage conducted by manja author Tetsuku Kariya and his team in Fukushima. Nothing the Itagawa character said deviated from the opinion of the real-life mayor. Kariya himself once told the media that he had suffered several bouts of nosebleeds and had been plagued by unusual fatigue following his visits to the Fukushima plant. In the latest issue, which was published this past Monday, May 12th, the former mayor of Futuba Town, which co-hosts the plant, and a university associate professor appear in the comic and confirm that the characters had nosebleeds due to radiation exposure. Story writer Kariwa has rejected criticism over the content Oishimbo and says he will fully refute the charges in a magazine in the near future. In his blog last Friday, Kariwa said people who are protesting through phone calls or emails to the publisher are mistaken. He also said that he's fully responsible for the content of the manga series. In the same blog earlier this month, Kariwa said he wrote the story based on information he had gathered in Fukushima over two years. He said he wonders if critics are suggesting that he should shut his eyes to the truth and write lies that are convenient for some people. Well, yeah, that's what they want, and good for you for not caving. In a completely cliched and expected move, Fukushima Prefecture has lodged an official complaint against Oe Shinbo, a government protesting a comic strip. Guilty! 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 You youngins go ask an old hippie as to what that refers to. Over to Japan, where remember that Fukushima frozen wall that was going to hold back all the water, all the radioactive water from the site, and keep it from going into the Pacific Ocean? Well, doesn't look like that's going to be happening. The Japanese government began funding the project after it was discovered that TEPCO had realized the need, yet hid the problem, and skipped the project due to the massive cost involved. So the Japanese government decided to pick up the tab. Now, 
There are concerns about how the wall might change the water levels inside the reactor building area. Any change to the groundwater flow could create groundwater saturating an area or subsidence of soil in areas as they dry out. So TEPCO is now using that concern to try to get out of their responsibility for installing and paying for the frozen wall. It was quick to use this opportunity to try and scrap the entire project. TEPCO's new idea, ah, bag that frozen wall and let's dump everything in the sea via the contaminated groundwater bypass wells. This idea was put out at a press conference that was headed by TEPCO spokesmodels Dale Klein and she's no lady Barbara married to a man named Judge. The bypass wells, by the way, are known to be contaminated with tritium and cesium, yet they are TEPCO's favored solution, as they've already been paid for and don't cost TEPCO any additional money. And as regards Japan's nuclear utilities and money, that's this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Two major Japanese utilities are reportedly asking for a combined $1.5 billion in bailout funds, underscoring the strain on the poor widow power company's balance sheets after the Fukushima nuclear accident. That's right, it is so terrible when your responsibilities cut into your profits. Kyushu Electric Power and Hokkaido Electric Power are in separate talks with the government-linked Development Bank of Japan as they struggle to contain mounting debt. As of now, the bank says nothing has been decided when they've been asked about the negotiations. Both power companies are expected to report their third straight annual loss since March 2011, when the Fukushima Daiichi disaster began. As for TEPCO, well, they're not exactly hurting these days. Tokyo Electric Power Company received a multi-billion dollar government bailout to keep it afloat in the face of massive cleanup and compensation costs tied to the accident. And somehow, TEPCO turned that around and for 2013 made $4.3 billion with a B dollars in profits. Now Kyushu and Hokkaido are saying, but you helped out Fukushima, why can't you help us too, ha, ma, ma, ha, ma, ha? Where in the world did they get the idea that companies that are run badly and do harm are still entitled to make a profit? Ray Lutz will have something to say about that as regards Southern California Edison. But for now, Kyushu Electric Power, Hokkaido Electric Power, and yeah, throw in TEPCO as well. You are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Well, if TEPCO has got that money, there are people who deserve to be paid. A former worker is seeking 11 million yen, or the modest amount of $110,000 in compensation from the operator of Japan's Fukushima nuclear plant for exposing him to high levels of radiation. Back in 2011, the worker was part of a team sent to lay electric cables in one of the reactors only 13 days after the accident. He said in a 2012 interview that plant operator TEPCO should have known about the high radiation levels and warned them. Doesn't that sound familiar? That is the exact same claim that is made by the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan in their $1 billion lawsuit against TEPCO for damages for being subjected to radiation off the charts and not being warned by the company. Among the illnesses that have already shown up in these sailors, who were before that healthy, young Americans, are leukemia, brain cancer, brain tumors, testicular cancer, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Women explain what that means to the men. Gallbladder removals, thyroid illnesses, hypogonadism, ulcers, and stomach ailments. And the radiation exposures not only hurt these young sailors, but also hurt their children who were born after their parents' exposure. All of this is documented by Charles Bonner, who is one of the attorneys dealing with the case. And it goes back to court on July 12 in San Diego as TEPCO is filing for it to be dismissed. 
One can only guess what they're trying to do to this rather modest request from a former worker for the equivalent of $110,000. The worker's so scared he will not even allow his complete name to be used, only his first name, Shinichi, and that is because of the social stigma of being labeled a troublemaker in Japan, let alone someone who has been harmed by radiation. And speaking of radiation, which we do all the time here on Nuclear Hot Seat, the European Geosciences Union General Assembly put together a team of scientists to look at the radiation dose received in North America as a result of Fukushima fallout. And the number they came up with is 400 trillion becquerels of cesium-137. They labeled this amount hazardous on a continental scale. One physicist talked about the certainty of receiving cancer if even a single radioactive particle, what Arnie Gunderson calls hot particle, is ingested. The team released its findings during an academic session of the aforementioned European Geosciences Union General Assembly. And one scientist, Michio Aoyama, who is a professor at Fukushima University's Institute of Environmental Radioactivity and a part of the team, told Kyoto News that TEPCO underestimates, isn't that an understatement word, underestimates the amount of cesium-137 that was released by Fukushima. Before we go into our next interview, I want to join in the happy dance that the Nuclear Hot Seat website is up again and finally looks much like it did before the hack attack. Yay! I may have gophers in my garden, but no more hackers on the website because we have locked down security. For those who missed last week's update, it was labeled a brute force login attack. That's actually a technical term. And it originated variously from Japan, Saudi Arabia, Bosnia, and it's continuing from bots around the world. They may be knocking, but they can't get in. Now, all of the security, all of this reconstruction did not come without a cost. I'm working now on a new improved website that's going to have even more security because it's a more recent version of a website and even better functionality and searching. So for those of you who have donated to help meet the cost of this, thank you so much. We couldn't have gotten this far without you. And now just a little bit more help is needed to meet this challenge. So if you can, please go to nuclearhotseat.com And again, I just love being able to say that again. Didn't know how much I missed it. But go to the homepage, scroll down just a little bit, and click on the not as big as before, but still a big red donate button. Your assistance will go directly to covering the expenses incurred by the website fix, and the new security systems will make certain that we stay up now for the duration. So whatever you can do to help, my gratitude. Ray Lutz of Citizens Oversight Project brought his engineering background to bear on the successful battle to keep the San Onofre reactors shut down. He now monitors the actions of the California Public Utilities Commission, or CPUC, on the final settlement on San Onofre. Good thing he's doing this, too, along with Women's Energy Matters and the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. Great group of groups. But, man, this is so necessary because you're not going to believe Well, maybe you will, but still, it's incredible. The fast one that the nuclear industry and our own regulatory body, put that in quotes, is trying to put over on the ratepayers of Southern California. The California Public Utilities Commission, or CPUC, has proposed a settlement in the case of San Onofre. Give us a brief overview as to what they're saying in the settlement, and then we can get into what's wrong with it. This was the investigation into the outage at the San Onofre nuclear power plant. So the settlement proposal is actually not, uh, you know, put forward by the CPUC, although it's within their process. It's been put forward by Southern California Edison, SDG&E, and, and especially TURN, which is the Utility Reform Network, which is the only outside party that negotiated it. Was that a group that was representing the interests of the ratepayers in a substantive way, or was it a pro-nuclear group? In theory, they're representing the ratepayer. That's their stated role. However, there is some question because of the way the compensation is doled out as to what these groups' priorities wind up being in the end. 
this deal that they put on the table was negotiated in secret. It turns out for about the last six months. And then on March 27th, they uh, invited all the parties into a meeting, and they said, here it is. It's done, and you can't make any changes, but uh, you can ask questions about it. <laughs> That's outrageous. In other words, as far as they're concerned, it's a fait accompli, and you have to accept it, or what? It looks like it has already been approved by the commission. And when I say that, I mean the California Public Utilities Commission, which is overseeing this, this cost issue. As opposed to the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which does only the safety part. So this deal, I believe that the, the utilities would not have ever, you know, mentioned it or said that they came to a conclusion unless they were already, like, 100% sure that the commission would approve it. Tell us what this proposed, probably done deal, but maybe not settlement, consists of. The grand total is $3.3 billion. And that's going to who? That's coming out of the ratepayers' pocket and going into the utilities' pocket and their investors. This is for a failed nuclear reactor where Southern California Edison was the one who made the mistakes with it. Right. And uh, you see... What's really infuriating about this whole thing is the way that they have avoided the actual most important part of the proceeding, which was the investigation into why the steam generators failed and who was responsible. They spent the last 18 months fiddling around with other things, and this was supposed to be phase three, and there was four other sub-proceedings that were merged into the phase three, and now with the settlement on the table, the goal is, of course, to not ever even start the Phase 3 record. So there is nothing in the record at all about the steam generator failures and whether anybody was prudent or not. So this is money going, proposed to go to Southern California Edison because they're not operating anymore without any sense of responsibility, liability, rate pay or refunds that were supposed to happen. Is any of that going to happen at all? Can that be reinstituted? There is a number of buckets, you know, within the $3.3 billion, and there's at least one bucket that we kind of agree with if they don't get any other money, and that is the power that was purchased when it was offline, because that power would have been bought even if the plant never was built in the first place, and that amounts to about $517 million. Interestingly enough, another item on the list is what they call O&M, which is operations and, and maintenance. And that's pretty much what it costs to run the plant. That amount is from about $650 million, more than it costs to buy the power. So basically the amount that they wanted to, to just keep the plant running was more than it costs to buy power on the market. So there's no way these, these plants are even where, anywhere close to being cost-effective from the standpoint of the ratepayer, from the standpoint of the utilities, they are a uh, gold mine because they can keep pouring in capital for improvements, and then they make a huge sum on the capital improvements. That's their main money-making scheme. So those are the buckets, a couple of the buckets, a couple more. One is nuclear fuel that they had in the pipeline, so to speak, coming in, and, and they, the stuff that they just loaded into the reactor and they probably shouldn't have. And, and there is also a whole section of this settlement that has to do with the litigation between Southern California Edison and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, which built the steam generators. I think that we should be the ratepayers should have no part of the litigation. That's their problem. But they want the ratepayers to be involved, but without any oversight or ability to affect it, but possibly getting some money in the end. I don't know. It's it's a real very complex settlement. That's why a lot of people were Form because they, they first said this was a $1.4 billion rebate to the rate payer. But <laughs> the reason they said that is because they changed the amount from $4.7 billion to $3.3 billion. And so that was a decrease from a ridiculous, obscene amount of money to just a ridiculous and absurd amount of money. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so they say that's a rebate. But the $3.3 billion will be paid according to this plan buy consumers for the next 10 years, and we'll also have to buy power on the market to replace you know, anything that it didn't produce. So pretty much paying double there, 
and then they get to do whatever they can from the settlement with MHI, and so there's sort of like triple or quadruple dipping into this thing. This is even more outrageous than the producers, where they made more money from a Broadway show that failed than one that would have succeeded. <laughs> this is this is outrageous, Ray. Well, so, unfortunately, the, what's this brought up for me, because I'm kind of a newcomer to watching the CPDC, another one of the issues that's really a concern is this issue about the intervener compensation. So if you're an intervener, unlike the NRC, the CPUC has a pretty cool thing, at least on the surface, and that is that if you're an intervener and you spend time in these meetings and so forth, you can file for intervener compensation. And sometimes this can be up in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. In this case, turn with the party to negotiate the deal, so they're going to make a lot more by going along and being pliable and so there's a big incentive to not be that much of an objector to things and just kind of go along and be a intervener in name only. So, in other words, there's a little bit of a taste that can be provided for anyone who is an intervener as long as you don't make too much of a fuss about this much larger amount of money. In other words, your a line item cost. Yeah, and most of the proceeding, you see, they have all these weeks of proceedings up there, but pretty much nothing that was done in those proceedings was used in the settlement. And the settlement was worked on in a separate whole track in the smokeful rooms. And so on the surface, like, we're, you know, what they said was when they started this, we're going to be really holding their feet to the fire. We're going to investigate this because the public was enraged. So time went on, and they just have let the public kind of calm down, and they were hoping that no one would see this. And what we're trying to do is shine a big, bright light on it and let people see that what's going on here is basically a $3.3 billion bailout of a company that imprudently managed their steam generator replacement project to the point where they were cited by the NRC for failing to follow the rules. So how much evidence do you need, really? I mean, why have a phase three if you've already been cited by the NRC for not following the rules? It's done. They should be assumed to be imprudent. And as a result, we think the most they should get out of this deal is just a little bit more than that $500 million because there's one other item that is reasonable. And that's it. And so the difference is about $2.8 billion between what we think they should get from the ratepayer directly and what they think they should get. The difference is we're saying, look, go ahead and salvage the plan. It's now worthless, so get what you can out of it. And go after your lawsuits and keep us out of it. And you do whatever you can. And we figured out that if they did well with their lawsuits, reasonably like get one-fourth of what they're asking for and get some from their insurance and so forth, that they could be almost hold down only like $35 million. So there's no reason for the ratepayer to have to cover them with $3.3 billion if they can do it on their own. I understand that there's going to be an evidentiary hearing on the matter held tomorrow, which is May 14, 2014, as we're recording this. What position is being taken by Citizens Oversight Project? We've already put in our comment, which anybody can read. Go to citizensoversight.org and, and look for it where it says uh, stop the unfair settlement. Look for our, our comments, and that goes through it in detail. But we're letting the, the practice attorney, uh, Mikey Geary, who is a former San Diego City attorney, take the lead on trying to get into the record specific details that we need in the record such that something can be done later. Because at this point, there really isn't much we can do. They, they said that the settlement can't be changed, and the only hope would be to somehow get enough dirt about the settlement to say, you know, this is so bad that commissioners, you should deny approval. And... The likelihood of that happening, given the fact that this was done in secret and probably with their nod of approval, is nil. So then what we need to get is into the record the information that can be used in a follow-up civil lawsuit that would, our goal would in a way be to try to blow the lid off of the corruption of the CPUC and how they basically are not a regulatory agency, but just a front end for the utility business that uses them to protect their interests. Ray, we're going to stay in touch with you and stay on top of this story because it's almost like a looney tune of fraud that's going on, but it has an official wash on it. So I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to the other intervening groups 
which include Women's Energy Matters and the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. And keep us up to date on what's happening as we watch what happens in the wake of a nuclear reactor being shut down for incompetence on the part of the operators. That was Ray Lutz of Citizens Oversight Project, or COP. He's the good cop. A reminder that with the website back up, it is again possible to get a free chapter from my ebook. It's my nuclear memoir. Yes, I glow in the dark. One mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. And if you just want to cut to the chase and have the entire story, you can go to Amazon.com, put in Yes, I Glow in the Dark, or put in my name and son of a gun. You'll find the ebook available as a Kindle. You can download free software in order to play the Kindle on any digital device so you don't have to worry about buying another piece of electronic equipment. When you do so, you'll have the story of what it's like to be one mile away from one of those nuclear reactors when, oops, it kind of goes off the rails. And beyond that, what it can do to a life and what it takes to get out of that and take an activist stance in the world. I would really appreciate it if you read it, and once you're done, Put a five-star review up on Amazon because that helps. And also, share it with people who don't believe in the whole nuclear story because I think they'll understand a bit more because of it. And while you do so, you're supporting me and allowing me to continue doing this work. So what can I say? It's a good deal. Go ahead. Do it. John Stewart. It is inevitable that we work together, Booby. Sooner rather than later, okay? Because you need a nuclear pundit on The Daily Show, and I am it. Anybody can put me in touch with John. Anybody can put me in touch with one of John's producers. Please do so. Send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Here's today's final thought. The stress of taking in all this toxic nuclear information takes its toll, not only mentally, but physically. It's great to get all jazzed up and excited and angry and want to spit bullets at the pro-nuke forces. But that's also a great way to destroy your adrenal glands. You can't live in overdrive, and even if you think you're getting away with it, you're not. Eventually, it will catch up with you. Now, this is total projection on my part, because in the aftermath of Three Mile Island, as well as all the other stressors I went through in my life, I fried my adrenals. What it means is that energy is a rare and fleeting aspect of my life. Sometimes I'm just too tired to do what my younger me would be up and at them. Let me tell you, it sucks. Because if I push myself into forcing my adrenals to fire up and move me forward, I go into deficit and it takes me multiple days to get back up to speed again. Now, I'm not saying this to fetch you. This is my truth. I deal with it. But don't let it become your truth as well. When you catch yourself firing into that heart-pounding, rage-expressing, Facebook-nuking mode, take three deep breaths and do something else. Don't push yourself into extreme emotional responses. The nukes will still be there when you come up for air. But like radiation, the impact of stress is cumulative, and by the time you have a full-body burden, your health has been compromised, and it will not come back the same way ever again. So kids... Do not let this happen to you. Take your breaks. Step away from the computer. Hug a tree. Hug a person. Hug an animal. Make art. Do some prayer and meditation. Write in a journal. Just don't let this subject take over more of your life than it already has. You'll be able to be in the game longer, experience more balance, and still have the energy to do things that have nothing to do with nuclear. Wait, is that possible? Son of a gun, I believe it is. So take care of yourselves out there. We need you in this for the long run. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 13, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, krqe.com, Santa Fe, New Mexican, Reuters, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by way of Erica Gray, timesfreepress.com, Japan Times, NHK World, fukuleaks.org, voiceofrussia.com, the societypage.org, World Nuclear News, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Love you guys. Everybody, join in. It's a blast. Special thanks to Myla Reason for enrichment material on the WIP situation and Mike Fluke for his continuing help making the website the online security equivalent of Fort Knox. 
Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. We're now on three times a week, including a flashback random replay on Tuesdays. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts, and we are back in business, so you can check into previous episodes by searching for them on the new improved website. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story, lead a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use, permission to reuse granted, as long as proper attribution provided, meaning the website, my name, and the email. Going out this week with music from Armageddon, The Living End. It always comes back to love. Music by Grady, lyric by me. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that Sister Megan Rice is still in prison because of her nonviolent demonstration against nuclear weapons. So we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. There are headaches and heartaches and pains on this earth and the fears they impart. Make us doubt our self-worth But I know we'll survive If while staying alive We'll remember the ember That has warmed us from the start It always comes back to something worth all of your care A concept you'll fight for Dare to be right for Someone whose life you can share It always comes back to love The cradle in which we can rest It always comes back to love There are dangers And strangers and hard times ahead If you think life is easy Well, you've been misled But I know we'll survive If while staying alive We will listen, just listen To the voice inside us It always comes back to love To something worth all of your care A concept you'll fight for Dare to be right for Someone whose life you can share it always comes back to love Wherever you go It comes back to that love It always comes back to love Oh yeah, go on, click the subscribe button we need to get subscribe and get this unity stronger and beat YouTube at their own game. Okay, that's what this is about. Like I say, go to the remix button, hit the remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad.